In, in my experience, there are two great food addictions that had to be overcome. One was potato chips, and the second was cheese, which I'm still struggling with. And now we're really fortunate to have with us uh, uh, Vince Razzianali. Vince is the, uh, a cheesemonger, American cheese buyer. And I have to ask you, Vince, does that mean you're American or you buy American cheese? He purchases the American cheese. And resident cheese nerd at Formaggio's Kitchen. If you've ever been there, I had to ask him, you're the guy that tells me it's okay to eat the mold. <laughs> and he says, yes, that's him. And he's trained everyone to say that, too. I find it disgusting. <laughs> so after working in fine dining restaurants to put himself through school and studying ancient history, he came into the restaurant food service business and then food retail. He worked his way up to the cheese counter at Formaggio's, and now he's really applied his nerdiness, as he says, to studying cheese. He works with restaurants around this area. He conducts, conducts cheese tastings, and he builds relationships with American cheese producers, and I guess that means craft. <laughs> so, Vin. So, cheese is probably one of the most misunderstood food products that's available. It's also one of the oldest food products that's available. Um, cheese is a fermented food product, which means that it was very, very likely discovered by accident. Um, there's an apocryphal cheese uh, discovery story that I do like to tell whenever I teach classes or conduct tastings, um, and that's that way back when, probably around 3000 BC, if not sometime earlier, there was a sheep herder or a goat herder, and they had uh, a young animal stomach that they would use to carry around their milk in. This is before Louis Vuitton handbags and all of the, um, you know, the hood milk jugs that you can buy at the grocery store. Um, They're using animal stomachs, made sense. Um, and in young animal stomachs, and we'll get more in, into this in a little bit, but uh, there's this enzyme called chymosin. Um, we know it as rennet as well. And this enzyme is a very effective milk coagulant. So um, essentially, this overland traveler would have had this stomach slung over their back, getting to where they ended up going. And it would have been warm. They would have been jostling this stomach around. And they would have opened it up and realized that it wasn't the milk that they started off with. It was something different. It was curds and whey. Uh, curds are solid ways of liquid, and we'll talk about what each of those are. Um, but nevertheless, this was different than the milk that the traveler had started off with. It tasted it, it tasted different, it tasted probably not unlike real cottage cheese, not the cottage cheese that we all grew up eating. Um, it tasted probably similar to yogurt, it's got, got a little bite to it. Um, and that was because the cheese had started to coagulate, it acidified, um, and it was different enough to where they realized that they could harness this ability over, over the years. They told their friends about it. Um, and now we end up with cheese from that traveler's, uh, I guess, accident, happy accident. Um, so cheese is one of the most dynamic food products that's available. Um, there's any number of flavors, textures, aromas that are available um, in the wide variety of cheeses that are available. There's really no set number of cheeses that are being made in the world in the thousands, if not more than that. Um, you can make cheese on your own, if anyone's ever made cheese at home. Um, it's a fairly easy process to do. You can make your own ricotta, something like that, something simple, uh, to, or just like a fresh um, farmer's style cheese. Um, but that being said, anyone can make cheese. So anyone does make cheese, and cheese has made the world over, and it has been since, like I said, around 3,000, 4,000 BC. So the question for us really is, What's happening with cheese as it's being made, and what's happening for us? What's happening with cheese as it's aging? Um, those are two very different questions. We'll try to get into that as much as possible. Um, I could probably sit here and expound on this for an hour or so, but get a short amount of time. So we'll have a good we'll have a good discussion now, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the reception afterwards. Um, so, milk is the starting point. Um, seems fairly basic to us. I my guess is that if you were to pull maybe 50% of the people in the US would probably not say that they know that cheese comes from milk or ha necessarily has to come from milk. Um, but this is the reality. Um, all types of milk can be used. Cow's milk, goat's milk, sheep milk, buffalo milk are kind of the standards. 
You can certainly make, make cheese from other types of milk. You can make it from camel milk or yak milk or reindeer milk or even human breast milk. It's been done. Um, if anyone saw that article uh, about a month ago in New York City, there was a chef whose wife was breastfeeding, had some extra milk, no freezer space. He said, what the hell, I'll make, uh, I'll make breast milk, cheese. And he did. And it was not particularly good, but he proved it could be done. <laughs> Apparently he was serving in his restaurant, which kind of was the, was the weird thing. So um, just make sure you ask about the cheese plates at the restaurants in New York you go to next time. Um, at any rate, so you're starting off with milk. Um, and those of you who are here, who are scientists, might know that uh, milk is actually one of the more, more complex um, or scientific products that's available. Dairy science is a huge field, very, very heavily studied up in Vermont, up at um, Biac. Um, in other places as well, but um, no one really has a terribly good handle on what's going on in milk, much less cheese. Um, I know there are people in the room who, who study cheese, uh, whether it's the paste of cheese or rinds of cheese, um, and there's there's still a lot of headway to be learned. And, and the fact of the matter is that people who are making cheese don't really understand necessarily what's going on. Um, attempting to get them to go to cheese seminars or cheese science seminars is not always the easiest thing to do. When you're someone who's been making cheese for 30 years, and someone tries to tell you that uh, you're doing it wrong, you should be doing it this way, you say, well, hey, listen, the, my cheese tastes pretty good, so back off. Um, at any rate, so you're starting off with milk. Um, milk is coagulated, um, and it's done intentionally. So essentially, milk is the preserved, spoiled version of itself. Um, this kind of gets into what uh, Dr. Wolf was mentioning, that basically you have this product that shouldn't taste good. It's spoiled milk. You've all had spoiled milk. You've all let milk go bad in your fridge. Uh, you know what that tastes like and smells like. Um, and to preserve that doesn't make much sense. Um, but you've all had really good cheese, and you all will have some really good cheese tonight. And you see that that's very different. And I think it's worth talking about what's happening there, what's happening in cheese as it ages. Uh, milk is made up of five main components. There's obviously much more going on than just these five, but these are the main ones that are worth our discussion. Um, you have water. Uh, milk is around 87, 88% water, depending on the type of animal, the type of time of season. Um, there's protein. The main protein that we'll be talking about, and really the main protein in milk, is a protein called casein, which comes from the Latin caseus, which means cheese. So, there's, uh, so whoever was naming these proteins had a pretty good idea that this had a pretty important uh, factor in cheese making. Uh, fat. We'll talk a lot about fat and what, how fat um, exists in milk, what it looks like, um, and how it affects the final product. Uh, sugar, this is lactose. Um, I'm gonna debunk a little thing you might think you might know about lactose and cheese. And minerals, um, which are, are seemingly minor compared to all these big components, but um, in reality, minerals are a big uh, uh, factor in the final flavor of the cheese. And, Cheesemaker works very hard, actually, to preserve the minerality within the cheese and not lose too much to the whey. That'll make sense in a few minutes. So um, we'll start with uh, what I think would be an awesome band name for all you science geeks who also have a side career, um, the milk fat globule. Um, so the milk fat globule is a uh, non-polar substance. So you're all familiar. Most, some of you might be science. Some of you might not be. For those of you who are not scientists, a non-polar molecule is essentially um, something that doesn't ha carry a charge. Um, water carries a charge, um, so wa water is a polar substance. And um, so in order to have the milk be immersed freely in water, it has to have what's, what we call the, what we call, what scientists call, I'm not a scientist, I'm a cheesemonger. Um, what scientists will call the milk fat globule membrane, and this is actually a polar membrane, so it's a very delicate membrane and it can, very, can be very easily broken. Um, so basically that membrane is what allows fat to remain evenly distributed throughout milk. Um, if you jostle the milk too much, um, that can actually lead to breaking of the milk fat, I'm sorry, the milk fat globule membrane, and um, that can actually lead to some pretty negative consequences for the cheesemaker. Um, what will happen was actually um, enzymes and bacteria can break down the milk fat globule, break down the long chain and short chain um, fatty acids into free fatty acids, and that can lead to bitterness, which is not a bad thing, and you actually encourage the development of bitterness through these short chain fatty acids, um, but it can also lead to rancidity, so I'm, 
I don't know if anyone's ever tasted rancid cheese. Um, I've tasted rancid cheese before. It's not a pleasant experience. It's much different than bitter. You look like that baby who has quinine in its mouth after you eat it. Um, but it's important, though, that the milk is treated well in order to protect that milk fat globule membrane. So I just want to make sure that we make that clear. Um, so uh, milk is very simply a liquid. You know liquid milk when you see it. And coagulated milk looks very different. Um, it looks like milk jello. And I hope you all at some point get a chance to go visit a cheesemaker and see um, the coagulation process from start to finish. It's really very fascinating, and I would encourage everyone to do that. You're obviously interested in cheese since you're here. Um, but what's happening in that coagulation is that casein, this protein that we talked about, um, is also a nonpolar molecule. Um, and it has a polar membrane on the outside, which allows the proteins to be um, con consolidated all together um, in the water solution. And they kind of, the best way to describe them, and there's no perfect picture of what they look like, but um, they look kind of like a, um, a ball with some little fuzzy things coming off of them. That's the, the scientific rendition of them. Um, and what happens is this hairy polar membrane um, kind of gets shaved off um, under either acidification or enzymatic conditions. And you end up with these protein structures that end up looking like a mesh. And what they'll do is they'll hold in the milk fat globule and allow the water to get through. So you end up with the protein holding in the fat and the water not involved in that anymore. So you end up with the solid and the liquid. Um, and then so within those curds, the solid, you have really the protein, the fat, and the minerals, all the good things essentially in milk. And the whey is really, there's not much going on there. It's mostly water. There's some um, excess proteins we call whey proteins. Um, and some of the minerality that's lost to the water in the acidification process. So um, whey doesn't do much for you. Most cheesemakers will either use it to spread on the fields. They might give it to pigs they have in the farm because pigs apparently love whey. Um, and sometimes they just throw it away. There's really not much to do with it. Um, so because you're all going to be tasting some cheese tonight, I wanted to make sure we talked about the reason why we chose these cheeses for you to taste. Um, the first and the the one of the main reasons why people might be here is to learn more about what makes stinky cheeses stinky. Um, so these cheeses are called washed rind cheeses. Um, and they are cheeses that are washed very heavily in a brine solution. And what that does is it creates a high salt environment on the surface of the rind. Um, and it attracts this particular bacteria called Brevibacterium linens. And this is a bright orange color bacteria. and that is related to the bacteria that's on your skin, that we call Brevibacterium epidermis. And this is actually the bacteria that thrives in the high salt environment of your sweat on your skin and consumes your sweat and releases a smell that we know as body odor. So sweat is actually not, doesn't have a, a smell to it, but that bacteria farts do. Um, that's essentially what's happening. And so there's, that's the main reason why you, when you smell a cheese that's a washed rain cheese and it's really funky, say the classic ones are Limburger or Munster, um, and you'll say, oh, this smells like a gym locker or dirty socks or any, whatever colorful descriptor you want to come up with. That's the reason why. It's because it's very closely related to this bacteria that is in your gym locker and your dirty socks. Um, these cheeses were developed very interestingly, actually, um, probably in, in Trappist and Belgian and French monasteries. Um, and the reason why, um, and this gets into a little bit of the, the science of it, and we can definitely talk more about this as we're upstairs tasting cheese, um, but the acidity has to be at the right level at the surface of the rind for this rind to develop. Um, and one big reason when you're, when you're milking cows, you leave your milk out, the lactic acid bacteria that break down the lactose that start the acidification process, process um, the longer you let that out, the resident lactic acid bacteria are, are going to go to town and acidify the milk, which will lower the pH and um, will change the character of the rind as the cheese begins to age. Um, Cheesemakers who are in a monastery, who have a bunch of cows, have a lot of manpower. I say manpower because it was manpower, not, <laughs> not, not people power. Um, they had a lot of manpower there. And um, essentially, they could milk cows, make cheese every single day, usually from one milking, sometimes two milkings. Um, so that milk wasn't left sitting out unrefrigerated didn't acidify too much, and the higher pH, lower acidity, would allow a washed rind cheese to develop. They would have tried making what we call bloomy rind cheeses, or brie, um, and these wouldn't have worked out very well for them because they, they needed a higher acidity. 
These were cheeses that would be made in farms, maybe from one cow or two cows, and you would need four or five milkings to make that cheese worth your time. Um, so they would leave the milk sitting out, at more or less at room temperature, and it would acidify. You have a lower pH, higher acidity, and you have a different final product. You would have tried to make washed rind cheeses as a farmstead cheesemaker in northern France, and you would have failed. You would, would, it wouldn't have been a final product, and eventually you would have realized that, hey, I, these, these brie cheeses, they wouldn't call them brie then, but the, these brie cheeses that I make are awesome, but these washed rind cheeses aren't very good. Um, so why do they smell? That's a big question, um, and one that I'm probably not terribly equipped to answer because I'm not a perception um, uh, expert, but they smell because essentially it's that bacteria that gives off this odor, and um, you end up with the same sort of volatiles, we talked about the volatiles, um, that affect the final flavor of the cheese. Well, I would encourage you to do the same experiment that um, Dr. Wolf mentioned, Close your nose and taste the stinky cheese that we have upstairs because that's going to be a totally different experience for you when you have your nostrils open. So, um, blue vein cheeses, I'm sure there are maybe at least a few people in the room who say that they don't like blue cheeses. Um, and these are cheeses that are made in an entirely different way, very distinct cheese making process. And what you're doing is you're adding um, what's called penicillium rope forti, usually. Um, there's a couple other different back or molds that you can add. You add this into the cheese as the cheese is being made. Um, and this cheese is an aerobic um, mold, so it needs oxygen in order to be able to create the bluing that you see. Um, another apocryphal cheese story that, that sort of defines how this cheese was made. Um, this, in the caves of Roquefort in southwestern France, you had this shepherd boy who had this simple farmer's cheese and took it into a cave um, to, to eat sat down, took a bite out of his cheese, and then saw a cute uh, lass walk by, and he chased after her, and then um, fell in love, forgot about his lunch, naturally, um, and came back a few weeks later to that same cave and realized that his cheese was different. Obviously, there was mold going on the outside, but the mold on the inside was different than anything else he'd ever seen, and that was because penicillin roqueforti was lining the walls of that cave, and still is, um, this particular strain of, of mold. And he tasted it, maybe or you know, against his better judgment, apparently not. Um, he realized that it had this very distinct kind of spicy, piquant flavor that we know as blue cheese. And he was onto something. Um, whether he actually developed Roquefort is a different story. Whether he actually existed is another story as well. But this sort of touches into this apocryphal, accidental um, theory of cheese history. At any rate, so um, this mold. Um, has that spicy pecan flavor that we all know, um, that some of us love, some of us hate, um, and you'll see that upstairs. And I would encourage you to try, we have um, enough for everyone to do this, I think, try a piece that doesn't have any bluing on it, and then try a piece with the bluing on it, and see what the difference is. And you really get the sense that sort of isolate what that blue flavor and texture is. Um, so, some final thoughts before we head upstairs and, and taste some cheese. Um, so, taste is, is very subjective. Um, Dr. Wolf touched on this. Um, aroma and taste are very closely tied to our memories. Um, and all of our memories are different. All of our taste experiences are different. Um, so you are, uh, every time you taste a cheese, you might be thinking back of a time when you were younger and you tried something else besides the Kraft American cheese that we all knew and, and loved to eat, to eat growing up. Um, so I would encourage you to, to keep developing those new experiences. Every cheese tastes different, every batch tastes different when you're working with a cheese that's not made in the factory. So keep, tr keep getting out there and trying new things. Hopefully all the cheeses that you're tasting tonight will be new-ish for most people. Um, and I think that it's important to talk about the science of cheese, and that's something I like doing. I'm obviously a fairly big nerd, but um, every cheesemaker that I've ever talked to insist that they're artists as well. Of course, they have to understand the science behind the cheese, if only for safety's sake, so they're not putting out a product that's unsafe for people to eat. Um, but they all consider themselves artists. They have a product that's different from ever, any other cheese anyone's ever made. Um, and they want to keep it that way, and they keep developing the product, and it changes every season, changes every day. So um, I think it's important that we understand the, the artistry behind cheese as well. So the question is, um, talking about safety of cheese, um, talking about raw milk versus pasteurized milk cheese and the government stance on that. Um, so the law says that, this is governed and regulated by the FDA, that um, cheeses have to be aged for 60 days or longer in order to be raw milk. A cheese that's younger than 60 days has to be pasteurized 
And it's not to say that any cheese that's over 60 days old is necessarily raw milk. It's obviously up to the, the decision of the cheesemaker. Um, pasteurization was a process that I'm sure everyone here is at least somewhat familiar with. Um, and this is developed by Louis Pasteur in, I think, 1864. Um, and what that does is it essentially kills all bacteria in a given food product um, in order to make it safe for consumption. Um, and this is important. Obviously, I would never try to, to diminish the importance of pasteurization, both for our current food state and for the development of food since 1864. But cheese is a pretty unique food product in and of the fact that it relies on um, it relies on these bacteria to make it distinct, to break down the fats and the proteins in the in the milk and the cheese. So um, I think you end up with this final product that's different when it's pasteurized because raw milk has all the bacteria remaining in there. Um, there's a reason why 60 days is this magic point um, because after 60 days, there's really no possibility of any bad bacteria existing in this complex environment inside cheese. Um, most cheesemakers will tell you that there's no possibility of that being in there at a younger point as well, um, but the government's pretty pretty firmly has a stance on that. I don't think that's changing anytime soon. So. Well, you, you could do that. You end up with a, a fairly inconsistent product um, in, in every way, in flavor, and texture, and aroma. Um, so most cheesemakers won't make what are called naturally fermented cheeses. Um, what they'll be doing is one of two things. They can work with commercial starter cultures that are available from cheesemaking supply companies, which most cheesemakers will choose to do if only because you're getting some consistency in your product. And all these other factors that make your cheese unique are, are under your control. Um, some cheesemakers will use a different starter culture method where they're literally putting la like an acidified batch of yesterday's milk into today's milk. Um, it's a very difficult to maintain, um, much easier to just work with a small amount of, of a commercially supplied culture. So, um, but you can certainly do that. Some traditional cheesemakers will do that. Uh, English cheddar, Somerset, UK cheddar uh, makers often do that, the second way of adding starter culture. So. Um, so I didn't touch too much on rennet. Um, what rennet is, is that enzyme that's in animal stomachs. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you always have to have animal rennet. Animal rennet is, is often favored by traditional cheesemakers because it apparently adds flavor. Um, it, who knows if that's really true. To really compare the two, you'd have to have the same batch of milk, you know, have one with animal rennet, one without animal rennet, um, and everything else would have to be the same. So really difficult to, to compare that claim. But other types of rennet that are available, uh, the most common one, at least used in the US, is called microbial rennet, which is harvested from um, a fungus called rhizomucor something or other. I can't remember the, the last of the, the species name. But it's also an effective milk coagulant. Anything that will coagulate milk is an effective way to get the process started. Um, so even something as simple as lemon juice or vinegar, um, thistle um, is a pretty commonly used vegetarian rennet. Um, there's a great article in Culture Magazine, which is a quarterly um, about cheese, essentially all things cheese, about thistle rennet cheeses. So definitely something worth checking out. Very different texture and flavor in the final product. Um, but and there, I mean, any anything can be used that will coagulate milk. Apparently, back in Homeric times, they were using like the sap of some fig tree, way back when, which I don't think has really really been fully discovered. But um, but there are plenty of cheeses that are made without animal rennet for vegetarian um, consumers, and you can. Any place you're buying cheese, any place you're buying cheese should know or should be able to find out whether or not cheese is made from animal rennet or vegetable rennet. So, well, I have to say, um, there's actually uh, someone in the room here who's done some really interesting work on cheese rinds, and it's one of my favorite cheese, anyways. But the cheese called Winemere from Jasper Hill Farm up in uh, Greensboro, Vermont. Um, I'll tell you why it's my favorite apart from scientifically, and I'll tell you why it's my favorite scientifically. Um, so, basically, this cheese is such a unique final product. Like, no one else is making cheese like this. This is of a Jasper Hill farm in Greensboro, Vermont. Um, they have 40 Ayrshire cows, and they started making this cheese, I think, about five or six years ago. And it's a washed rind cheese, but it's washed in a, in a beer that was fermented in the cheese aging facility. Um, so it's just kind of this Vermont hippie project where it was basically like, <laughs> Two guys who I've met both of them, and I've tried the beer itself, and it's pretty actually fascinating beer. But they were probably sitting around doing what Vermont people do best, and they were like, "Yeah, man, we should totally make a cheese, and then we should ferment a beer in the room where the cheese is aging, and then wash the beer, wash the cheese in that beer, and then see what happens." And they did that, and that's awesome. And, um, 
and it's actually uh, wrapped in bark from a farm next door. Um, so it's so it's this cheese that's like funky and fruity and woodsy and herbal and savory. It's just such a cool final product of cheese. Um, so that would be my favorite cheese just in the story itself. Um, Rachel Dutton, who's a microbiologist at Harvard, has done some work on cheese rinds. And she actually just uh, forwarded me and some of the people up at Jasper Hill that her or preliminary studies on the rind of Winamere. Um, and maybe, I don't know, Rachel, do you want to speak to this? I'll, I'll let you, I don't have to put you on the spot or anything, but like she's finding bacteria and molds that are present in, in Etruscan tombs, things like that. <laughs> I'll let Rachel speak to it because she can do it much better than I can. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this, this gets back to what we we're talking about with washed rind cheeses where you have um, uh, bacteria that thrive in high salt environments. And it's called halophiles, which means salt-loving uh, bacteria. Um, and so these are such interesting, I can pull up the little sheet if you want. I'm not gonna do that. Anyways, uh, but we could talk about it more. And Rachel, I'm sure, will be happy to talk more in depth about it. Not to put her on the spot, but. Um, so that's my favorite cheese scientifically right now. But check with me in a few months. I'll probably find something else interesting. I don't know. All right, I think that's yeah. about it. Yeah.